Good afternoon, everyone. Um, while we are waiting for the last of our attendees to get um, in the webinar, we'll get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar with Doug Talmy. My name is Lisa Roberts, and I'm the Executive Director of the Florida Wildfire Foundation. If you're new to us, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildfire habitat, and we achieve that in part through educational events like this one. We certainly appreciate your participation in the, this event, which is kicking off our observation of National Wildfire Week. Each week, year during this week, we ask our friends and supporters to visit flawildflowers.org slash support to make a donation or become a member or even purchase the state wildfire license plate in order to support free events like this one. Our work really does uh, depend on people like you. Our partner in this event is the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. Its plantrealflorida.org website helps Florida gardeners and property owners find retail sources for native plants and related services. Many fan members off are offering curbside pickup, delivery, online orders, and more to safely serve customers during this special time. Please visit the website to find a native nursery near you. We would also like to thank our sponsorship partner, Florida Power and Light for helping to make this event possible. FPL is committed to be, being a leader in environmental protection and stewardship by collaborating with, collaborating with partners on uh, conservation opportunities unique to Florida and its diverse ecosystems. FPL believes that protecting our environment is a collective responsibility and they proudly support our efforts as well as those of other environmental organizations as we educate the public about the importance of conserving native plants in the wild and using them in landscapes. And this webinar is also supported by the state wildfire license plate. Whether you have this old look or the new one, you're providing funds for wildfire education, planting, and research across Florida. So before we get started, I wanted to mention to you that your microphones will remain muted during the webinar. However, if you have a question, you may enter it in the Q&A portion of your webinar screen. We expect to field many questions during this event, and if for some reason we don't get to yours, please feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org. Now, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Doug Tallamy. Doug is a professor in the University of Delaware's Entomology and Wildlife Ecology Department, where he has authored 102 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. One of his chief research goals is to better understand how insects interact with plants and how those interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. Doug is probably best known for his books, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens, was published in 2007 and has persuaded many, including myself, to make changes in the way we landscape. In 2014, he co-authored The Living Landscape with Rick Dark, and his new book, Nature's Best Hope, was released in February and is now a New York Times bestseller. Now I'm going to pass the controls over to Doug and we'll get started. Okay, let's start. We're gonna make some insects. Um, some people think that, that uh, a guide to restoring little things that run the world comes from me, but it really doesn't. That is uh, something that E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson said many years ago, way back in 1987, uh, he wrote a paper. I've been lucky enough to, to meet this great man, one of the most famous biologists of all time, but certainly our time, certainly the most famous entomologist. He's a Harvard uh, Emeritus Professor right now, he just turned 90 this year, still writes a book a year. Um, we can do an entire seminar on, on how great E.O. Wilson is, uh, but I've been lucky enough to meet him twice in my career. Once was uh, about 40 years ago, but uh, the other was more recently when he received the Ben Franklin Award at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. 
I met Ben as well, but I was much more excited to, to meet uh, EO. He was getting this award for a lifetime achievement in science, but it really was focused on his lifetime achievement in uh, his efforts to save life on Earth, to save biodiversity, and he's been working at that for a long time. One of the first things he did was write this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, 1987. This was in the very first issue of Conservation Biology. So the entire discipline of conservation biology as a scientific discipline didn't start till 1987. Anyway, he had a very simple message in this paper. Life as we know it depends on insects. If they were to disappear, and this was fairly theoretical in 1987, nobody was really worried about them disappearing. But if they did, most of the flowering plants would also go extinct. Uh, and that would, that would end the energy flow that supports the food webs that support most of our animals. So our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, and our mammals would also disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot as opposed to having the rapid uh, turnover of nutrients that insect decomposers provide because they'd be gone. And of course, humans would not survive any of those, those changes. So it was a somber message, uh, but, but yes, it was largely ignored. Nobody really could imagine that insects would disappear. As a matter of fact, in 1987, and perhaps even today, we are spending a whole lot more energy worrying about how to kill insects. And besides, if we, if we depend on insects, why do we have National Insect Killing Week? Now, this was a while ago. This was uh, 1929. But uh, here's a campaign to boost the sales of all brands of chemicals to rid the community of insects. It doesn't talk about harmful insects. Just all insects are things that we have to, have to get rid of. Uh, and that has permeated our, our culture. Uh, even if we do succeed in killing all the insects in agriculture, and if we kill all the insects at home, we don't seem to worry about losing insects in general because we tend to think they are still common in our natural areas. Well, there are two reasons that's not true anymore. Um, and one of them is that uh, we don't have enough natural areas to sustain the number of insects that we need to sustain. Uh, and that's because we've, we've, of course, turned those natural areas into our cities. They are not designed to support insects. We've turned them into our suburbs, which are not designed to support insects. Or even our rural areas go out to the country. They're not designed to support insects either. And of course, we have agriculture. Um, tremendous area. About half the country is in, in agriculture. 770 million acres of rangeland alone, uh, which is 18 times larger than the state of Florida. Uh, and that's designed to support cows. It's not designed to support, support insects. And most of it's overgrazed, as you see here. So very poor place for insects. As a matter of fact, food production for humans now claims about half of the Earth's land surface. And none of those areas are designed to support insects. The other reason that our natural areas are not uh, doing well with, with insects these days is that almost all of them, and in Florida you can certainly appreciate this, have been invaded with plants from other continents those invasive species we talked about. This is a picture of a park near me. I, I took that in uh, March uh, of a year, a few years ago, when all of the Asian plants leaf out before plants from North America. So every bit of green you see in this natural area uh, is not natural at all. And as we'll see in a few minutes, those plants are very poor at supporting insects. Um, yeah, invasive, invasive plants destroy insect populations. We now have more than 3,300 species of introduced plants that we consider to be invasive. And by the way, the definition of an invasive species is uh, a non-native plant. It's got to be non-native. I hear people talking about invasive natives. They probably mean aggressive natives. We do have aggressive natives, but you got to be non-native to fit the definition. And those species are aggressively displacing native plant communities. That's the definition. So we are winning our war against insects. Uh, and that's why we're having headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Of course, EO told us what it means for the rest of life on, on Earth. It's, it's not good news. Um, and we're starting to get uh, data um, that makes us, makes us uh, um, um, print those, those types of, of headlines. We've lost 50% of our Midwest native bees from their historic ranges in the last century. Um, there are four species of bumblebees that have declined 96% in the last 20 years. So they're not extinct yet, but they're functionally extinct. They're now um, so rare in, in our ecosystems that they're not performing their ancestral role. 
we have one bumblebee species that is uh, already extinct and possibly two others. You know, it takes a while before they declare you extinct. You can't, can't have been seen in, in uh, a couple decades. And we got about 25% of our bumblebee species at risk of extinction. That's just bumblebees. Um, in Europe, they've, they've done a better job of, of measuring insect declines. About 30% of, of Europe's uh, orthopterans, the grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets are facing extinction. Most of the data has actually come out of England and Germany. Germany had a, a study that kicked this all off. 79% decline in flying insects since 1989, and, and those declines were measured in natural areas, not outside of natural areas. Germany has already lost 46 species of moths and butterflies completely. Uh, but this stat down here is the big one. Invertebrate abundance and think insects has declined 45% globally since 1974. What has this done to the things that eat insects? Uh, well, it's clobbering them. And we, you know, let's, let's talk about birds. They're the most uh, um, charismatic of our insectivores that are out there. There was a study came out a few, few uh, months ago that says we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 40 years. And not 3 billion species, but, but just in terms of abundance. And this is a decline of even our common birds. And I, were, I wanna remind you how big a number a billion is. One million seconds is 12 days. One billion seconds is 31.7 years. So it's a big number and we now have 3 billion fewer breeding birds, about a third of all the birds in North America, not here anymore. 432 species of North American birds are now considered to be threatened with extinction. Not because there's only five members of each species left, uh, but because of the trajectory of the population declines. These, these species are declining so rapidly, we now know that's the, the signal of impending ex extinction. Uh, and, you know, more headlines, one million species face extinction, says the UN, uh, possibly within the next 20 years. By the way, you know, these re reports come up and we say, oh, that's too bad. They're not options. We cannot allow this to happen. Not if we want to be happy and healthy on this planet. It is not an option to lose one million species. And most of those, by the way, are insects. So does it matter? Of course it matters. The creatures that keep us alive are disappearing. So let me, try to, um, let me try to get inside your head with this. We humans are incredibly bad at reacting to long-term risks. I think I could sit here and say, you know, oxygen is disappearing and nobody would, would really care because you can still breathe. You only react to it when you can't, can't breathe. So um, because we're so bad at, at uh, long-term, assessing long-term risks, uh, I want you, we're, we're actually pretty good at feeling protective of other animals. So I want you to look at this from the perspective of another animal. I want you to become this magnolia warbler. Um, they have recently passed through Florida on their mag migration. Um, you are now this magnolia warbler. You spent the winter in the Telemaca Mount Mountains of Costa Rica. Uh, and then in the spring, you turned around and you flew north. A lot of people say, fly home. Well. They actually spend seven months of the year in the tropics and only five months up here. So um, home is probably the tropics. But anyway, they fly north and they're about to do the, the most dangerous thing that birds will ever do. And that is migrate. Why is it dangerous? Well, predation risks are high. Um, it's physiologically really taxing. Migrants lose about 35% of their, their body weight during their long flights. So while they're crossing the Gulf of Mexico, but even over, over land, they're losing a tremendous amount of of uh, weight. Um, somebody last year was cutting open the, the stomachs of tiger sharks in the uh, Gulf of Mexico and during migration they were filled with migrating birds. These birds don't make it across the ocean, they crash into the ocean and the tiger sharks are there. Um, and again, over, over land they're losing that much uh, body weight uh, as they go as well. So when they stop to rest, and they do, they have these stopover sites, they have to eat a lot of insects. They've got to put on 35 to 50% of their body weight at each rest stop just to continue their migration. So we might wonder if migration was so hard on birds, why did it evolve? And the answer is it evolved uh, for the same reason that anything evolves. The benefits outweighed the cost. Costs were very high, but the benefits were even higher. So what are the benefits of migrating? The benefits of migrating 
come from that flush of new leaves that happen, is happening right now up here in the temperate zone. We get all these new leaves coming out each year. And what follows that new leaves is a flush of the insects that eat those leaves. And that is the benefit of moving north. Um, that flush of new resources doesn't happen in most areas of the tropics. The tropics are very constant. There's a tremendous amount of competition for the food that is down there. Um, so there's no seasonal uh, flush of, of resources. And the fact that there are so many resources up in the temperate zone um, triggered migratory behavior. If birds moved up to take advantage of that, instead of rearing two to four offspring per year, they could rear three to six. And that was enough to make the difference to offset the costs of, of uh, migration for birds. So I want to emphasize this. Bird migration was only adaptive. It is only adaptive because there are so many seasonally available uh, insects in the temperate zone. Uh, how important are insects to birds? This study came out in 2018. I have no idea how they measured it, but uh, the claim was that birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year. Uh, and uh, sadly, it was, it was, um, the gist of the article it was that look how good birds are at controlling pests. So again, all insects are pests in our, our, in our culture's mind. Not so. Let's rewrite that and say birds require 500 million tons of insects each year. And if we reduce the available amount of insects, we're going to reduce the population sizes of birds. So when migration evolved, there are plenty of insects in the temperate zone. Is that still the case? Do we have enough insects up here to justify the costs of migration? Well, in most places, no. At least every time we, we measure it, no. Um, let's just focus on the impact of introduced plants like Brazilian pepper plant. You've got so many, I mean, Florida is the poster child of introduced plants. You're competing only with Hawaii in terms of the number of species of introduced plants. What happens to the available food when, when we allow that to happen? Well, we, uh, I'll just share one, the results of one study I did with an undergraduate a few years ago. We went into hedgerows in Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania that were invaded with plants like autumn olive and, and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and multiflora rose and porcelain berry. Those are our big in, invasives right here, and that's an invaded hedgerow. And compared it with hedgerows that were not invaded with these Asian plants. In terms of the, the uh, um, health of the caterpillar populations in those hedgerows. And what we found was a 68% reduction in the number of species of caterpillars in the invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those caterpillars, and a 96% reduction in the biomass of those caterpillars, the amount of energy that's actually flowing through that ecosystem. Or you can just say a 96% reduction in the bird food in the invaded habitats. And if you're wondering, um, what removing 96% of the food looks like, uh, you can do that simple experiment in your yard. Put out your bird feeder, fill it one day, count all the birds, all the individuals that use that bird feeder all day long, then take out 96% of the, of the seed and put it up the next day and count how many birds are there for how long. Uh, that's what's, what's happening in our natural area. It'd be just a, a tiny percentage of what can be sustained if you have all the food that's there. Now this doesn't affect just a few obscure bird species. It's most of the, uh, well, a good many of the birds in, in North America. 386 species of neotropical migrants may no longer have enough insects to justify migration. We're talking about our swallows and our swifts, our orioles, our hummingbirds, our vireos, our tanagers and buntings and flycatchers, our thrushes, our warblers, almost all of our warblers are, are neotropical migrants. Our bobolinks, our night jars. Um, and let's not forget all the resident birds. They're not migrating, but they need insects to rear their young uh, each year as well. Uh, the chickadee, of course, um, we're familiar with that. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars required to make one clutch of chickadees just to the point where they leave the nest. And then the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days after that. So it's many thousands more. And the chickadee is a tiny, tiny bird. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit of research uh, from my recent PhD student, Desiree Narango, to show you what happens uh, 
when a chickadee tries to breed in a landscape that is not rich enough in caterpillars to support its breeding. She looked at, at uh, chickadee reproduction, Carolina chickadee reproduction in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And what she did was put up artificial nest boxes in a whole bunch of places. This is where the nest box was. This is one breeding, the, the uh, foraging range for one breeding pair of chickadees. Uh, it's about 50 meters from the nest on, on average. The blue areas are the plants on which they did 96% of their foraging while they were feeding their young. So let's look at what those plants are. Uh, well, these are all the, the native trees up in, in, uh, in that area in Washington, DC. Basswood and sweet gum and American elm, black cherry, two species of oaks. But let's also look at the trees that the birds did not forage on. Uh, and those were the plants from Asia, Japanese maple and silk tree, ginkgo, black poplar, great myrtle, saucer magnolia. And it's very easy to picture a landscape where these ornamental plants are the, the dominant um, woody plant features. Uh, so that allowed her to compare chickadee reproductive success over a three year period in landscapes dominated by native plants. None of them were 100% native and landscapes dominated by non-native plants. And some of those were 100% non-native plants. When they were dominated by non-native plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away you reduce the amount of food for the chickadees by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So even though there's a nest box there, and even though uh, um, cavities are always limiting in our, our suburban neighborhoods, the chickadees came, they looked around, and they said, there's not enough food here, we're not even gonna try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs, those nests were 29% less likely to survive at all. The nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and they did it slower. It took them 1.5 days longer to accomplish that. Uh, and you might say, well, those don't sound like huge differences, but if you put all that together in a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass in your landscape, this is what it looks like. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which this population has to reproduce, has to make more chickadees to replace the adults that die every year. If you make this many chickadees, you have a stable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking. If you make more than that dotted line, you have a growing population, but if you are below that dotted line, you have a shrinking, unsustainable population. And those, those lines intersect right around here, around 30% non-native plants. So if your landscape by biomass is 70% native, you have a, a shot at, being, uh, at supporting um, sustainable bird populations. Um, so there's two good things about uh, this, this research. First of all, this is the first time uh, that we have tied, that anybody has tied bird reproductive success to the plants in the landscape where they are, are trying to reproduce. Uh, so that's good news. If you ever doubted that your plant choice actually makes a difference, um, this study ought to convince you. But the other good news is it suggests an opportunity for compromise. And that's this area right here. Um, you can have up to 30% non-native plants in your landscape. And as long as you are balancing that with the 70% native plants, um, you can have a, a sustainable bird population. And that is good news because if, if my message was, you can't have any non-native plants in your yard, my audiences would be far smaller because most people want to see those, those, those really pretty ones. You can have them as long as they are not dominating your landscape and as long as they are not invasive. Uh, Desiree also looked at the uh, migrating birds that stopped at her, her uh, study sites in Washington. You know, our birds fly at night when they're migrating. She had 51 species, by the way. They fly at night and then they come down and they rest during the day. Now they don't fly around our cities. You'd think that'd be a good idea, but uh, they don't. They go right through them the way they always did. It'd be hard to fly around them anyway. They're everywhere. And when they come down, those are stopover sites, they have to eat in order to continue their migration. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo uh, or, or any of these non-natives that don't make enough caterpillars, there's nothing to eat. A lot of people say, well, I don't have a property that's big enough to support breeding birds. And that may be true. But if you have a property big enough to support one tree and you make it the right tree, you can support migrating birds and they will appreciate it. They will use your tree. What if I said to you, introduced plants are reducing your bank account by 96%? My guess is 
you would get it that introduced plants are probably not something we wanted to have in our landscape and it's certainly not something we want to to go to the nursery and buy and add more well insects are the currency in our ecological bank accounts and we're, we're losing them at a tremendous rate and we're losing them because of the way we landscape Remember, it's our ecological bank account that keeps us alive. It is not, it is not the, the grocery store down the street. So we have two choices. We can create landscapes in which nature thrives, where we have all these insects, uh, or we can create landscapes that are, that are ecologically dead. The first option will sustain us. The second one will not, not in the long run. Um, so I think our only viable option is to live in harmony with the natural world that sustains us, to live sustainably in the natural world sustains us. Remember what the opposite of, of, of sustainable is. It's unsustainable, it means it's not going to last very much longer. Um, so I don't ever see that as an option. Uh, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to live sustainably with, with the natural world? Well, one thing we can't do is ignore private property. 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored private property in our conservation efforts, we'd only be working with 15% of the land, which means any preserve would be too small and too isolated from each other, from, from other preserves, uh, to sustain the species that we need to run our, our ecosystems. We need functional ecosystems everywhere, not just in a park and a preserve. So what we have to do is create lands or, or convert landscapes like this uh, into areas that actually make insects. How are we going to do that? Well, first let's look at the causes of insect declines. Uh, there are, are six big ones. This is the, the cause of insect declines has been described as uh, death by a thousand cuts. There's so many little things happening uh, and, and that's a good description. But the misuse and overuse of pesticides is certainly a major cause. Habitat loss, of course, you know, when you build a house or pave a road, there are no insects where that house or road is now. Um, the, the profligate use of these non-native ornamentals that don't support insects, and again, we'll talk about why in a second, is a major cause. That then escape our gardens and become the invasive species that are in our natural areas. 86% of our woody invasive species are escapees from our gardens. We don't have to wonder where they come from. We buy them in the nursery, we plant them, and then they're out into the wild. Security lights, we'll talk about that, and climate change is a big one. But more good news, five of the six here are things that, that you as an individual, or we as a group, can address almost immediately. It's not hard, we don't need governmental permission. We can change the quality of our habitats by addressing these five by factors. I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to give you the assignment of changing climate change by, by tomorrow. Um, you know, we're going to change climate change in the voting booth. So I will give you that assignment uh, in November. You get to work on it then. Uh, so let's just, let's talk about these. How are we going to change those? What we have to do is raise the bar about what we ask our landscapes to do. This is a, a house down the street from me, by the way. I'm not making this up. In the past, and unfortunately still in the present, a lot of us view plants as decorations. So we go to the nursery, we find something that's pretty, and we put it in our yard. And we've been doing that for more than a century. Um, and I understand that. Prints are, are decorations. You know, they could be pretty, they could be screens or anchors or focal points, but it's all about aesthetics with no thought at all to the ecological role these plants need to start playing in all landscapes. And when we landscape, with uh, the idea that plants are just decorations. This is what you end up with. You end up beautiful designs. Um, this actually is from Disney World. Um, but then landscaping equals ecological destruction. This is not a functioning ecosystem. There's nothing living in there. So why don't we pick pretty plants that actually produce what we call ecosystem services that support the food webs that are absolutely necessary everywhere, protect our watershed, store carbon, carbon um, create healthy, pollinator populations, um, support the natural enemies that keep things in, in balance. All of these things need to be happening uh, at home and they're all gonna happen when we pick the right plants. And when we add ecosystem function, ecological function to the criteria we use when we select plants, then landscaping equals ecological restoration. And I'm gonna call this uh, 21st century landscaping. We have done 20th century landscaping uh, and it's not working. Um, we, we are now in the midst of the sixth great extinction on, on planet Earth. So let's give 21st century landscaping a try. 
Okay, what does this have to do with making insect populations? Well, we cannot restore ecosystems without restoring insect populations. So let's move on to that. There are a lot of insects out there, a lot of insect species. Which ones should we focus on, on making? We got, you know, three to four million species worldwide, 164,000 described species in the US, but still many that haven't been, been described. We're not gonna have all of those in our yard. So which ones should we focus on? Uh, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this simple. The two most important insect groups, in my view, are the insects that maintain plant diversity. Plants are the first trophic level. They're, they're capturing the energy from the sun and we need all of those plants. So we need the insects that maintain those plants. Uh, and then we also need the insects that take the energy from those plants and distribute it up food webs. And those two groups are of course the pollinators and maybe a surprise, caterpillars. So let's talk about pollinators first. Um, why do we need pollinators? I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna say what you have heard and I've heard 10,000 times. We need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's a very anthropocentric view of why we need pollinators. Uh, that figure's not, not accurate. That's been re reanalyzed. May Berenbaum at the University of Illinois, Illinois uh, looked at that last year and said, well, it's really uh, about one seventh of our crops. And if you look at the typical diet where we rely heavily on corn and wheat, which are wind pollinated, or soybeans, all, you know, they're not pollinated by insects. Then it's about one twelfth of our crops. But uh, forget our crops. That's not why we need pollinators. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. It is simply not an option. We're not talking about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. And once the, the presidential campaign gets underway, I fully expect this to be one of the top things that they're talking about. What is a pollinator? Um, again, important issue. Um, everybody, a lot of people think that any insect that goes to a plant is a pollinator. But a, a true pollinator is an insect that transfers pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts of the flower or from the male flowers to the female flowers. They may or may not be on the same plant. If they don't do that successfully, then we're gonna call them flower visitors. They are getting resources from the flower. They're eating the pollen or they're drinking the nectar, but they're not moving pollen back and forth. So who are the major pollinators that actually move a whole bunch of pollinator, uh, pollen? Well, we do have one species of, of honeybee. Uh, it, is, it is an introduced species, and we introduce it because it's so good at pollinating so many of the crops that we also introduced. Uh, but remember, before we introduced the honeybee, all of the pollination in North America, the insect pollination happened successfully without it. So uh, who's doing that? Well, 4,000 species of, of native bees. Um, they're really, they're the workhorses. They're doing uh, most of our pollination. Uh, we also have 14,000 species of moths and, and butterflies. About 2,000 are still undescribed. Um, now, moths and butterflies in general are not nearly as good at pollinators as the native bees are, but um, some are actually specialized pollinators on particular plants. And if you go out, butterflies in particular are terrible pollinators. You know, people say we got to save the monarch to save pollinators. Nah, monarchs not pollinating anything. It's the moths at night that are pollinating plants. Go out and look at your flowering plants at night with a flashlight and um, many of them will be dripping with, with moths, transferring a lot of pollen. So let's focus on the 4,000 species of native bees first, but first we have to talk about what a bee is. When I say to people I would like you to, to increase uh, habitat for uh, bees in your yard, they say absolutely not because they will sting me. I say, no, no, they're not gonna sting you. Uh, native bees, most of them are, are not social. They're solitary, so they're not defending a hive. Uh, and you can actually pet them when they're out foraging and they will not sting you. And they say, nope, that's wrong. I was stung last week. What they're really talking about are wasps, the yellow jackets. 90% of our native bees are, are solitary. These guys are social wasps, very aggressive. Uh, so we're talking about our wasps and our hornets. And please don't, don't worry about the murder hornet that you're hearing so much about now. The only place it's been found is Washington State. Um, I do believe they'll be able to er eradicate it before it gets here, but um, it is a nasty little bugger. So I'm not, I'm not 
promoting large colonies of these wasps that will hunt you down and sting you in the back of the head. I am promoting these native bees that are, are um, actually docile. This is a leaf cutter bee. You can, you can pet him. See, he's lost his hair here because so many people have pet him. Uh, what do they need in our yards? They need a place to live and they need something to eat. So where do our native bees nest? Um, most of them nest in the ground, actually, but some of them nest in woody stems and some of them nest in pithy stems that they, they hollow out. Uh, so let's look at those ground nesters. 70% of our native bees are ground nesters. So if you have a piece of property that um, has ground, and I'll bet you do, you uh, it's a potential site for native bees to nest. Uh, they prefer uh, diggable soil, but there are species that will do well even in hard compact clay. This is a little Kalides bee, very, very shy. As soon as my shadow hits her, she dives back down in here. And she digs a, a straight tunnel and then little offshoots on the side of the tunnel where she raises, excuse me, her young on pollen. Um, pithy and woody stem nesters hollow out the stems and then they make a series of, sh of cells. This photo is from um, Heather uh, Holmes, and each one's uh, younger than the next. So this is the oldest one. This guy, this is the bee larva. It's eaten uh, some of its pollen here. It's going to get bigger. This one's a little younger. This one's younger yet. And when they complete the development, they'll tunnel out through the sides and you'll have holes. Um, well, where are these things happening? They're happening in the dead stalks of last year's growth in our, our meadows. Uh, and when we chop all these things down because they look ugly, then we've just eliminated the nesting sites for uh, many of our, our, our native bees. This is uh, elderberry, softwood, easily excavated by, by wood uh, boring uh, bees. But what happens when we have a dead uh, stem on an elderberry? We cut it out uh, because that makes us a good citizen. But if we can leave one or two for the bees, that would be good. Well, one thing we have done, we've compensated for the, the lack of, of a coarse woody debris, that dead wood stuff that we don't allow to lay in our, our yard, by making bee hotels. We invented bee hotels, which are holes of different sizes, and different species of bees will, will use those holes um, and make their nests in them. Uh, and they do use them, and some people uh, have gone to great extents to keep the bees happy. But there is a problem. There's a, a, um, some research that has been done that says, you know, this may not be such a great idea um, because you end up putting, putting all your bees in one basket. When there's only one site for these uh, whole nesters to nest, they're all in the same place. And if a disease or a predator finds them, um, then they are wiped out. So it's far better to make tiny bee hotels, put them in an area that's not going to get rained on, and scatter these all over your, your property, and that will be much more successful. What do bees need to reproduce? They need pollen, and they need nectar, and they need it all season long. Here's data from New England, where it gets cold, but even in New England, there are native bees out foraging from March all the way to November, and they need flowers to forage on uh, that entire time. In Florida, uh, you need flowering plants all year long, all year long. What species of flowering plants do you need for your native bees? Well, Sam Drogi, who uh, up in this neck of the woods is Mr. Mr. Native Bee, says what we need to do is meet the needs of our specialists. There are generalist bees that can go to lots of different flowers, and there are specialist bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plant genera. If we put the plants that service the specialist bees in our yard. The generalist bees can use those plants as well. So in that sense, we're serving all the bees. If we only put plants that the generalist bees can use, and that would include all those, those uh, non-native flowering plants, then you've lost all your specialist bees. Why are bees uh, specialized? Because flowers are so different from each other. They, they flower at different times. They look and they smell differently. They have different levels of, nu of, of nutrition here. And the pollen morphology is species specific. And these little bumps and things, that helps them hang on, helps the pollen hang on to the hairs of particular species of bees. So uh, specialist bees have formed very close association with particular plant genera. Um, I will... I believe I've got a slide later on that shows you some of the uh, top, top plants for specialist bees. Let's talk about caterpillars though at this point. Caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other insects and that's why they're so important in, in food webs. Um, why are, are, are they so important? Let's, just, let's talk about them in terms of bird food webs. 
a number of reasons. First of all, they are they are soft. I think of this guy as a uh, a sausage with a very thin wrapper. The wrapper is exoskeleton. It's cuticle. It's undigestible. The birds don't want a lot of it. And because it's soft, um, you can stuff it down the throat of your your uh, offspring without fear of, of injuring it. Let me see if I got a slide of that. No, I don't. Um, and that's that's important. They're large. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of, of 200 aphids. Uh, so you can chase 200 aphids around or you can get one, one caterpillar. I know which what I would choose. They're nutritious. They're very high in protein, very high in fat. They have a low percentage of chitin, of exoskeleton, compared to other uh, insects, particularly beetles. Beetles aren't like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Uh, so a lot of a beetle is totally undigestible. And they're the best source of carotenoids. For, for birds during the breeding season. And carotenoids are essential components of our diets that are only made by plants. So what we need to do, it turns out the caterpillars are, are essential uh, to, to bird health. So we have to increase the number of caterpillars in our yards. How do we do that? Well, we add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that make them. And unfortunately, most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. Most plants don't make a lot of insects, which means we have to be choosy. We have to pick the ones that do, or we're gonna have a failed food web. Why don't most plants make a lot of insects? Because plants don't wanna make insects. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded the leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter, or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there now. It's not because uh, there are no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. Uh, and if you don't believe me, when you, when you uh, finish watching this, go outside and grab a leaf of anything and eat it. See if you like it. You're not gonna like it. All plant lineages are, are protected chemically. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants um, are what we call host plant specialists. They can only develop and reproduce on the plants with which they share an evolutionary history. Uh, it's taken them a long time to, to come up with the physiology, the enzymes that can store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that uh, allow them to minimize their exposure to those compounds. But again, it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plant lineages for all these adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. Um, so crepe myrtle supports no, no caterpillars. Um, English ivy supports no caterpillars. Plant choice matters is what I'm trying to, to tell you. I'm gonna use some examples from, from my house to try to convince you of that. Uh, if you wanna have Pandora Sphinx, and I did wanna have Pandora Sphinx, I have to put the plant that, that creates that, that uh, insect in my yard. And that happens to be Virginia creeper. I planted it on my back porch the first year we moved in and it took a year, but then I got uh, the the, uh, the Pandora Sphinx. Um, I also wanted the tulip tree silk moth, so put in tulip trees and the tulip tree silk moth came. Um, Luna moths, in our, our neck of the woods, Luna moths eat sweet gum. As you go to other parts of the country, they, they vary what they're eating, but they're very specific on, on sweet gum. We have sweet gum, we planted it. I wanted the zebra swallowtail because I think it's the prettiest of all the swallowtails. This is the northern limit of uh, pawpaw. There's pawpaw specialist, but I planted pawpaws uh, and waited nine years. We were 26 miles from the nearest zebra swallowtail population that I knew of. Uh, it took nine years for them to, to find our pawpaws, but they did, and we now have zebra swallowtails. Um, great, very powerful moth. Give you that beautiful eight-spotted forest moth. And of course, these are just examples. We have a lot more. Uh, types of insects that eat grapes and these other things. Viburnas will give you the, the green marvel, goldenrod, the most powerful of the herbaceous plants. Um, 110 species of caterpillars on goldenrod and you get beautiful things like the brown hooded owlet. Even poison ivy gives us caterpillars like the beautiful utilia. I know what you're thinking, oh, poison ivy, no, it's gonna get me. You know when you get poison ivy? You get poison ivy when you try to pull it out. Just leave it alone. Leave it alone and you will have the beautiful utilia. You can run faster than it can. So on and on we go. The sculptured moth is on persimmon, the Hebrew on black gum, the fawn sphinx on our poor beleaguered ashes. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I think that's, that's art in the garden. 
Maples are very important plants. Rosy maple moth on maples. The royal walnut moth is my favorite of the, the giant silk moths on walnut and, and hickory. This is already extirpated from New England, by the way. Um, just, just to convince you that insects are disappearing. Elms, very important uh, plants, double tooth prominent on elms. Um, witch hazel dagger moth uh, is on witch hazel. Pines are important. I know you've got a lot of pines in Florida that give you the imperial moth. Even our native uh, clematis gives us specialist moths like the spotted thyrus. Two-toned ancillus on ironwood, lost outlet on button bush, the herald on native willow, snowberry clear wing on coral honeysuckle, the native honeysuckle. The evening primrose moth, believe it or not, is on evening primrose. Showy emerald on sumac, not poison sumac. I've never even seen poison sumac. That's a plant of the swamp. Uh, but on the staghorn and, and smooth sumac, the great soil stabilizers up here. Then we get the real powerful plants. The, the powerhouses like black cherry can give you the white furcula, the crocus geometer, the io moth, the beautiful cecropia moth, the colorful zaley, the tufted bird dropping moth. And I ask you, who would not want the tufted bird dropping moth in their yard? The paddle caterpillar. Send your kids outside. Have them find the paddle caterpillar and ask them to figure out what those paddles are for. They're not there for decoration. They have, they have a, a function. And don't tell them the answer. Let them think about it. And I'm not going to tell you the answer either. I want you to think about it. It's the same reason that the filament geometer has these expandable filaments on its, on its back. Small light sphinx, these guys are all on, on uh, black cherry. So is Harris's three spot that wears a, an umbrella of its shed head capsules over its head. And if you get close to it, it whips it around and slaps you with it. Uh, then the hag moth on, on oak. Oak's the most powerful plants we have. Hag moth thinks it's a tarantula. Redwash prominent, the white dotted prominent, the spiny oak moth, the skiff moth, the white blotched heterocampa, the oak skeletonizer, solitary oak leaf miner, the crown eucalyptrix, half oval ancillus, the pink striped oak worm, the spun glass caterpillar, and literally hundreds more. Um, just at my house, just at my house. Where did I take all these pictures? This is my house. This is what it looked like when we moved in. The area had been, been uh, mowed for hay. I should stop saying my house and say our house. My wife does live here too. I'm actually sitting right in that window right now. Um, so there weren't many plants there uh, and we put the plants back and that's why I'm counting the species of moths that we have in our yard uh, right now. And I'm up to 940. I keep adding, adding species every time I go out. Um, so uh, we do have a little bit of lawn there, but we put the plants back and that includes all of these plants. I won't go over them, but we purposely put plants in each one of these lineages brings in new um, lineages of moths, but we tolerated things that most people consider to be weeds. You know, a weed is a plant out of place. These are good native plants. They belong here. They are not out of place. And that includes greenbrier and dotter and black walnut. And every time we add a plant lineage to my yard, I get new species of moths. And because we've added those plants to, to our yard, we get the birds that eat those, those moths, the bird food. Uh, we get wood thrush. Wood thrush joined us last year uh, on the property. Um, it's, you know, breeds in the woods. Well, we put a lot of trees back and they're, they're uh, only 20 years old at this point, but uh, that's old enough for the wood thrush. They're happy now. And we've got them because we've got Virginia creeper making the lettered sphinx. That's what it's feeding to its offspring here. We've got indigo bunnies because we have alders making ruby quakers. We've got chipping sparrows because we have black walnuts making gray edged bomolocas. We have field sparrows because we have oaks making red line panopotas, tufted titmice because we have black cherries making dowdy pinions, phoebes nesting on our light bulb over our front porch because we have native grasses making skippers. We've got robins because we have lots of those weeds, those native plants making lots of, of uh, uh, white line sphinx moths. Carolina chickadees because we have tulip trees making tulip tree beauties, white eyed vireos because we have spice bush making spice bush swallowtail. House friends because we have hickories making copper underwings and bluebirds because we have sycamores making drab prominence. In fact, we have 55 species of birds that have bred on our property because we have so much bird food. In other words, it works. I want to talk about uh, an important um, component of our restoration here, and that is the concept of keystone species, keystone plants. Oaks are keystones at, at our house. We have found that just 5% of uh, the native plants in any given area of the country are making about 75% of the food that drives those food webs. Uh, and if you don't build your landscape that in, in a way that includes that 5%, you're gonna have a, uh, a failed food web. 
So in Florida, um, it says Doug Tallamy talking right over my number there. It's 398, I can't read that. You can read it. Caterpillar species are supported by oaks just in Palm Beach County. I don't know what county you're in, but um, there are a lot, of, a lot of caterpillars on oaks in, in Florida. Um, compared to the, your major in, invasives, uh, air potato supports three species of, of caterpillars. Your podocarpus supports three species. Your bamboo supports one species. Your crepe myrtle supports no species. Your camellia support no species. So with these introduced plants that then become invasive, you do not have functional food webs. Point is that by choosing the right plants and by using more of them, we could make insects nearly everywhere. I want to leave you with nine things that you can do to restore insect populations and thus ecosystem function in your, your yard. And I'm going to start with cutting your lawn in half. Um, I know you have too much lawn in Florida. We've got too much lawn up here. Uh, lawn is a dead space. We've got over 40 million acres of lawn in the US, which is now uh, greater than the size of New England. Um, and what I'm proposing is that we cut that area of lawn in, in half. Uh, that would give us 20 million acres to work with and we could create what I call homegrown national park, 20 million acres in size that would be bigger than most of our, our large national parks combined. Uh, but we have to put the plants back into this dead space. I drive by this, this uh, church in Mississippi um, at least once a year and everybody's inside worshiping God's creations and on the outside they're killing them with, with lawns like this because we're just not thinking. We're not thinking. Plant for specialist bees. Yeah, there's our slide. Um, so here are the top, the top um, plant genera that will support the specialist bees in, in Florida. If you have all of these genera, and you're talking about sunflowers and, and uh, golden asters, goldenrod, I should have highlighted, italicized that, false um, golden aster, um, gumweed, silkgrass, asters, tick, tick seed, black-eyed Susans, you can have 102 species of specialist bees, just the specialist bees, then all of the generalist bees will, will follow. Um, so this is work by Jared Fowler, who's, who's trying to um, come up with, with uh, lists of specialist bees for all, all over the country, very valuable work. So you wanna, you know, if you're wondering what can I plant for the bees, go for these, these top producing ones of, of specialist bees. Okay, remove invasive species from your property. Um, this is a no brainer. Uh, those, you know, invasive species are ecological tumors. They do not stay on your property. They go out into the quote, natural areas and they castrate them. Um, so if you have a small property, this is easy. Don't go to the nursery and buy new ones. If you have a large property, uh, possibly you have the, the resources to, to do this. It's a, big, it's a big job, it's a big problem. But if we all did it, remember we'd be 86% 80, done. These are uh, some of the major invasives in your area, which I'm sure you already know, Australian pine, melaleuca, Old World Climbing Fern, Water Hyacinth, uh, Japanese Honeysuckle, Lantana, um, Rosary Pea, Camphor Tree. We don't have any of these guys, but uh, I know you do. So don't tolerate them on the side of your property. They're, they're very bad. Use those keystone species. Uh, so in, in your area here, the, the keystone uh, genera, for, for Florida and you know, I stopped because I ran out of room. These, each one, these are the highest rank and then it goes down. So what you can do is go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, uh, put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, woody and herbaceous plants for your county pops up. Uh, and for most of Florida, it's pretty good. When you get down to the southernmost end, it becomes uh, semi-tropical. Uh, it's, it's not as accurate. Uh, we're working on it though, we're working on it. Um, so it gives you a good idea. The old, the old excuse, I don't know what to plant, uh, what's good for, for wildlife. Um, not so anymore, we do know what to plant. Preserve your leaf litter and ground covers. This is something we're just starting to think about. So I'll give you an example from uh, where I live. I live in Chester County, uh, Pennsylvania, where the oaks in Chester County support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the oak. They eat the, the caterpillar eats the leaves and it spins a cocoon and hangs from the, the branch, then it emerges as an adult and then does it again. Um, 
I wish everybody did that. I wish all the moths did that, but they don't. 94%, 480 species in Chester County, Pennsylvania, fall off the oak. They drop from the tree and pupate in the ground. They dig a hole in the ground if the ground is loose enough that they can do that. And they, or they, they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the ground or under the tree. And you see where I'm going here. That's not the way we landscape. We don't have any leaf litter under our trees and we mow and compact the soil um, so much that our caterpillars can't, can't penetrate this. So this becomes a great ecological trap. It pulls moths in, the caterpillars develop, and then they can't complete their development. Another reason we have insect declines that nobody's talking about. And of course, the cement landscape is even less desirable and this totally destroys our, our watersheds. This is typically what people do. They put a plant and then they, then they have a big lawn around it. And, and I hope we're able to measure this summer what moth survivorship, caterpillar survivorship is in a situation like this. But I can guarantee it's better here. Build a layered landscape. You've got your tree and then you've got your, your shrubs or maybe understory trees, your ferns, your ground covers. You're not mowing this. You're not trampling it. This is where you can do your, your fancy gardening, uh, some place that's safe where the caterpillars can drop down, tunnel in, spin their cocoons, uh, and and um, complete the development with much more much greater success or you can put in your ground covers now these are all species that are appropriate for where I live but I'm sure you've got great camp ground covers you can use put motion sensors on your security lights security lights lights at night kill insects and and down in Florida you're killing insects every single night of the year when you have these lights on and I know the argument I have to have a security light on or the bad man will come Okay, put a motion sensor on it uh, so that it only comes on when the bad man comes and you're not killing insects all the time. After a hundred years of, of uh, trying to figure out why insects go to lights, we still don't know. Um, not all insects do, but most of them do. And it's typically a one-way trip. It's a one-way trip because they exhaust themselves. They fly in around and around and around that light or they sit on the wall and the birds pick them off in the morning or the bats come down and pick them off during the night. Um, tremendous mortality at these lights. So the first thing you'll notice when you put your motion sensor on your security light is how often the bad man does not come. But if you don't like that, take the white light out and put in a yellow bulb. And a yellow LED bulb on all of your outdoor lighting is, is the least attractive to insect. Almost no insects are attracted to LEDs. If we all switched over, um, the best thing is to have no lights at all. But if you wanna have lights on and we all switched over to, to LED lights, we could save billions of insects almost instantly, and it wouldn't cost a lot of money to do it. There was a study in, in France, um, 2018, where they uh, put on night goggles and they looked at the moths that were pollinating plants at night, counted them all in a particular area. Then they erected lights in that same area and were able to document a 62% decline uh, of, of, in the moth populations in that particular area. So uh, it really does eliminate moths. Oppose mosquito spraying. You know, I go all over the country talking about uh, Mosquito Joe. And I say, well, this, this really took off when we had Zika virus come into Florida. Um, the other states did not have Zika virus. You actually did. Or at least you had people carrying it. It was never documented to be reproducing in, in Florida. Um, just to understand what you're doing when you hire Mosquito Joe. Uh, he says, well, it only kills mosquitoes. Not so. It kills all the insects that it's, it's um, the fog touches. And he says, well, it's a natural compound, so it's okay. That part's true. It's a pyrethroid that comes from plants. But cyanide is a natural compound as, as well. It doesn't mean we should be spraying it all over the place. We're working hard to build insect populations. We don't want to build mosquito populations. So this is the best way to control mosquitoes with mosquito dunks. Get a bucket, put water in it, put some hay or straw on there, let it ferment for a day or two. It becomes an irresistible oviposition site for most mosquitoes. They will lay their eggs in there. When the eggs hatch, you put in a mosquito dunk, the larvae come up and they eat the dunk. And this is Bacillus thuringiensis in here. You get these at the hardware store, by the way. Um, and it kills them. It's, it's, it's targeted. It only kills mosquitoes, nothing, nothing else. If everybody had mosquito dunk buckets out, your mosquito population would, would take a nosedive. As a matter of fact, minimize insecticide use uh, in general. Homeowners um, use more pesticides per acre than are used in agriculture, believe it or not. And other than what's used for termites, almost all of it is absolutely unnecessary. It's there just because most of us have entomophobia. If you see anything crawling, you got to kill it. No, you don't. 
And by the way, who knows what all of this spray is doing to us. Um, most people don't mind living in an envelope of poison as long as they get to kill those, those insects. Reconsider that. Finally, um, join your homeowners association, your civic association that says you must landscape in a particular way uh, and change from within. Um, these things are really, the, these old rules made in the 70s that, that are there to protect the status of the neighborhood. Uh, we're not made with any ecological knowledge at all, but you can protect the status of your, your neighborhood by um, classy landscaping that simply uses native, native plants. Okay, finally finishing up here. Um, I want to I want to uh, return where we started, and that's with E. O. Wilson. In 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth: uh, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And his message in this book was that we need to preserve ecosystem function. We need to have functioning ecosystems on half of planet Earth, or we're going to lose life on all of planet Earth. And he spent most of the uh, most of the book explaining the science behind that, that statement. And then he ended the book. Uh, so a lot of people, uh, including me for a while, saying, well, well GEO, um, how can this be possible? Remember, half of planet Earth, of the terrestrial planet Earth, is already in agriculture. We're probably not going to reduce that. Uh, and the 7.8 billion of us are stuffed in the other half, along with all of our infrastructure, all of our airports. You know, the, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. Got a lot of infrastructure out there, 4 million miles of paved roads. How are we going to preserve ecosystem function in all those areas? Well, I think we can do it. We can do it. We can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation. The old approach uh, was based on the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist. Humans are here, nature is someplace else. There is no someplace else anymore. Now we need to coexist. We need to save nature where humans are. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. Uh, I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, even your yard, even your golf course, all of the places that we dominate. We can no longer leave conservation to the conservationists. There aren't nearly enough conservationists. Now we all have to play a role, particularly if we, if we own property. It doesn't mean that we have to save biodiversity for a living, but it is a good living. It does mean we have to think about saving it where we live. I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. Um, there are a lot of really, really horrendous environmental problems out there. Uh, and a lot of people feel powerless to address them. But this is something where you can actually plant a plant, plant one of those keystone plants, watch the life come to it, get positive reinforcement, realizing that you as a single individual actually just made a difference and then do it again. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable. Manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire world's problems. Don't worry about all of Florida's ecological problems. That's, you know, that gets depressing. Just worry about that piece of property that you own. Or if you don't own any property, just worry about the, the park that's nearest you where you can go and you can, you can uh, volunteer your, your labor. So as property owners, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do that is going to depend on, on uh, the, the future of nature is going to depend on whether or not we decide to do that. I think we can do it. Um, I do believe that collectively we are nature's best hope. So thank you. Thank you very much. That is all I have. And I guess. And I'm going to swing in here. You're going to swing in there. Okay. If you would um, make me host again, I would, I would appreciate oh, it. <laughs> I will stop, stop sharing. Is that what you mean? Um, I think you have, actually have to make me host again. But, yeah. Um, I think you yeah. have to make you host. Okay, so um, okay. we have um, a few questions for you, Doug. Okay. Um, okay, and um, some of them are really good. Unfortunately, we won't have time for every one of them, but um, how long should stems be, um, be up before cutting them back? If, if we remove them but place them elsewhere in our garden, is that still okay? Um, isn't the pruning of dead and dying structures required for the health of a plant? Hmm. Okay, three different questions. Um, the first one, 
Actually, the more we learn, uh, <laughs> the better job we can do, but sometimes it gets a little harder. I used to think that a lot of our stem nesting bees spent the winter uh, or, or made their stems in the, the stems of current season's growth. Uh, it turns out that's, that's not actually the case. They use last season's growth. So you can't cut it back ever if you want them to, to uh, use that. What you can do is cut it down. Apparently most of the nesting happens within two feet of the ground so you can cut off the, the top parts. I would leave them um, anytime birds are eating the seeds uh, at the top. You know, you don't have, um, you don't have that big winter time during the, uh, in, in Florida, but that's when you would want those seed bearing parts of the plant to be up there and then you can, can cut it back. But a lot of people are asking, can we cut it off at the ground to remove the unsightliness and maybe bunch it up and stand it up some other place in, in the garden or in the yard? I don't see why not. You know, this is so new, nobody's tested that, but that ought to work just fine. It, it should function very much like those, those bee hotels. Um, and do we need to cut back plants for the health of the plant? Eh, um, you know, who was cutting back the plants before we got here to, to cut them back? And the plants seem to do pretty, pretty well. Uh, if you want a prize specimen to, to win at your state fair, that's probably true. But if you, if you're, I think plants are pretty good at, at managing their own, their own growth. So, um, so I would say, no, you don't have to for the health of the plant. But remember, okay. I'm an entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and what is your take on cultivars? Um, and that's, that's a, always a sticky one. Um, how do we know when a modified native plant no longer provides ecological value? Can you elaborate on the ecological currency, how, how the currency relates? And is it more important than the local grocery store? <laughs> okay. Um, there has been very little research on the ecological value of, of cultivars, but I do know of, of two studies. We did one of them. Uh, and the answer is, it depends. It depends on what the genetic change was that created the cultivar. So a cultivar is, is just a genetic variant of a particular native plant. And um, so it's capturing a narrow portion of, of the genotype of that entire species because it expresses a trait that we like. Um, we looked at six different traits that are common that have nothing to do with flowers. So taking a tall plant, making it short, introducing disease resistance, enhancing berry size and fall color and changing green leaves to red or purple. Uh, and we found the only one that decreased insect use was changing green leaves to red or purple because that introduced anthocyanins to the leaves and those are feeding deterrents. And those unfortunately, at least up here, are very, those are very popular cultivar types. Everybody wants red leaf this or red leaf that. I don't know why, I actually think they're ugly. But, um, but the other traits didn't, didn't make a big difference. But, but let me just add, most cultivar traits are propagated clonally. Uh, which means you're putting zero genetic variability out in the landscape. And we know that that's not a good idea, particularly in the age of climate change where we're getting such erratic swings in, in climate. We need more genetic variability than ever so our plants can handle that, that, uh, those wild changes. Uh, Annie White at the University of Vermont looked at what happens when we create cultivars out of flowers. We're altering petal size or petal color. Uh, and there the, the news isn't quite as good. It's very easy to mess up the relationship between uh, those specialist bees and the plants when you start fooling with, with uh, plant, with flower um, size and, and shape. Because that almost always, flowers have, uh, have finite energy budgets. So if you make flower petals bigger, it usually takes energy from nectar production or pollen production and you have less of it. If you make a double flower, you've taken all the reproductive parts of the flower and turned them into two petals. Very pretty, but then it offers absolutely nothing to, um, to native pollinators. What I would like to see is nurseries offer straight species to the public so that they can decide. Most nurseries do not carry straight species because they don't think there's a market for it. So we need to change their opinion. Remember, nurserymen, are, they're businessmen. They just want to sell a plant. If we convince them that there is a market for the straight species that we know are ecologically effective, um, then they'll start carrying more of them. Okay. 
Great answer. <laughs> um, is a reduction in turf grass in our in our suburbs really going to help the insects and birds? Absolutely. What do we put in our turf grass? Uh, we put uh, herbicides that make sure there's nothing but grass there. So, uh, so around here, that would kill the violets uh, that are that support like 35 species of, of uh, specialist bees. It supports our fritillaries. It kills any plant other than grass because you want that perfect golf course look. Then we put a lot of, of fertilizer on that then runs off and creates your your uh, red tides and all the other horrible things that 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 you have, or the dead zones in the uh, golf. Um, and then we mow it. So even if we didn't kill all the insects, we mow it and kill them at, at that point. Um, plus, it's a, it's a non-native plant. It's a cool season European grass. Actually, you've got a lot of crabgrass down there. Almost any other plant choice, native plant choice, is going to support more than, than your lawn. So when I say cut your lawn in half, the, the half you keep, you should still manicure. It's a cue for care. It shows you're not a communist and you are a good citizen and your neighbors will love you but you will have more plants in your yard that will support the wildlife around you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, are there communities in the Eastern US that have taken a holistic approach to landscaping with natives and where is it, where are they and where, where is it being studied? I'm getting that question more and more uh, and every place I go, I don't go any place these days, but when I used to go, people would tell me success stories where they're doing it either on their own private property or their, their uh, civic association is getting together and doing it. And I've been very poor at, at keeping um, all of that in my head. I will tell you that, that if I were to pick a single city where there are a number of groups working together with uh, city planners uh, and, and the, the, uh, the local governments, it would be St. Louis. Um, they have several organizations, uh, so um, they, and they've, and it's been that way for a year now, I mean, for, for several years. Um, now, St. Uh, Missouri has, um, they have a one-eighth cent sales tax, I think it's something like that, that um, goes to conservation. And the and you know what the public keeps voting it back, so they have had money to spend on conservation that other states haven't had, uh, and they've had it for for um, oh, I don't know more than ten years at this point, and it's really paying off for them. But if you if if you're interested in getting um, your local township on board, I I can give you some names of people in in St. Louis that can give you some tips about how to do that. Um, I've heard other stories. Um, Reston, Virginia. Uh, years ago, bought uh, somebody bought everybody on on uh, some land management council bringing nature home, and then they they passed a rule that all the all the uh, public plantings in Reston were going to be native from there there on. Nashville, Tennessee has done uh, a lot, um, so I don't want to I don't want to slight anybody. You know the the California Native Plant Society is ex it's large and extremely knowledgeable. Uh, very powerful, and they're they're making huge headways in a lot of uh, places in California as well. So this this is happening. Um, there's reason to be optimistic. Um, I, I I I will try to do a better job at getting you success stories, but they are happening. Mm -hmm. Great. A um, couple more questions, if you have time. Um, would raising the bar for entry into the landscaping business, such as training and certification? be an option for improving plant selection? Yes, uh, most, most homeowners do not do their own landscaping. They don't do their own gardening. And that's particularly true for, for young people that have kids and, and they're, they're doing their life. They're not outside managing their landscape. So what do they do? They hire somebody. Uh, so what I would like to do is, is uh, help create a, an entirely new industry, we call it ecological uh, landscaping. So what you actually could hire somebody who will do what we're talking about. I got two people even locally have said, I want to hire somebody who can I hire and I don't have a name to give them. Even though, you know, this is, this is where I live. It, that's a critical hole, it's a vacant niche right now. Most people rely on the, the mow, blow, and go guys that uh, are not trained in this at, at all. So we do need to increase our knowledge base for how to do ecological landscaping. And you don't have to worry about it. You hire somebody, they'll pick the right plants that will, will survive in your particular situation. 
Uh, it doesn't take that much knowledge, but it does take some knowledge. There's, there's got to be training. So I'd love to see these types of training opportunities pop up all over the place. If we really do cut our lawn in half, there's going to be less lawn for the lawn industry to cut. How that those people uh, becoming trained in, in managing the areas that, that we take out of lawn. They're not going to be managed, you know, maintenance free. They're going to need management. Yeah, exactly. A um, couple more. Uh, what is a good resource for seeing natural, the natural geographic ranges for caterpillars, butterflies, and moths? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, there, there are two in the east. You've got Dave Wagner's uh, Caterpillars of Eastern North America that will give you um, he gives you verbal descriptions of the ranges. It's pretty general. Uh, there are uh, two Peterson guides uh, by uh, David Beadle and Seabrook Lecky, Peterson Field Guides to Moths of Northeastern North America, but now they have one to Southeastern North America where they have maps, um, general maps of the distribution of, of these things. Uh, and and those, are, those are good starting points. Uh, it might be, might be, Better to track it down from the perspective of the plant. If you know something is a host plant specialist, find out where that plant is. And there is a, uh, a web source for that. It's called BONAP, B-O-N-A-P. Um, I forget what the acronym stands for, but you can go to the plant section and put in the genus that uh, you're looking for. And it will give you the exact distribution for, uh, it's every, every plant in, in North America both the natives and the, and the non-natives. So if the plant that this insect eats occurs where you are, you should expect that that insect either is there or was there. Right, and a last question. Um, are the stats and reports you're citing available on your website? And if not, where can people find them? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I think about this. You know, I've got two websites. The the university website does list uh, all of all of our our scientific papers, uh, and several of them are up. I did. We just re reworked our website and put PDF files of um, our most recent research. That's where you'd get the the actual uh, scientific papers. And if you don't find them there, send me an email, and I'll just send them to you. Um, I'm not. I am not good at. at keeping my website up to date. I, I will admit that right away. Great. But if you're just looking for the numbers that were in this talk, are, Lisa, are you posting this talk, I thought? Yes. So you can just go to that and get those numbers. Yeah. Okay. And um, Doug, I really want to thank you. Um, we've had a wonderful uh, crowd and wonderful reaction to you hosting. And I always learn something, even though I've, I've heard you speak numerous times. Um, but we will be sharing a link um, to the webinar recording. So uh, watch your email for that and share it with everyone. Everyone needs to hear this message. Uh, we want to end the webinar and uh, wish you a happy and safe National Wildflower Week. And please visit flawildflowers.org slash support to help our wildflowers support the little things that run the world. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Doug. And thanks for the opportunity, Lisa.